This is Paul. This is Caroline. And welcome back to our continuing coverage of the fifth season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That was our dog, Maisie, honking her baby. <laughs> and this is for the fifth episode, The Pirate Queen. Maybe she, that was like her, like asserting herself, like, this is Maisie. <laughs> <laughs> we could mic her up. <laughs> and hilariously, you guys might be thinking, did you guys name your dog Maisie after Mrs. Maisel? No. She's named after a preschool mouse named Maisie Mouse 14 years ago <laughs> when Mrs. Maisel was just a glint in Amy Sherman Palladino's eye. This was our dog, Maisie. So this is Kismet. Who knew, Paul? Who knew? Before we get started, I wanted to give a shout out to listener Lucy Wall, who left us a five-star review on iTunes and said that although we don't always uh, agree with uh, how she sees the show, she still enjoys the podcast, which is great to I hear. I love that. Yeah. And you know what? You guys don't have to agree with everything we're saying. I assume that when you're talking with your own friends, you don't agree with every single thing they say. So fun and cool. Thank you so much for listening. I know we did get a review that was a little bit uh, more... I'm not going to say negative. That's not exactly the right word. But they, they did have some constructive criticism. They felt that I was talking too much about Gilmore Girls. For me, I just want to just point out for, for like sort of like larger picture. For us, we've known the Paladino's work for a long time, for decades. So if you hear me talking about Gilmore Girls, it's really because when I look at Mrs. Maisel, I'm looking at it really in this Paladino universe of shows that they created and characters they've created. So, you know, there's just so much. I, and I know coming forward, there's going to be some more guest stars. So, you know, I... <laughs> I don't want to say I apologize for bringing up Gilmore Girls so much, but I, I will say that it will be less and less because really we were talking about it at the beginning because there were so many like first times these characters were like coming back on our screen. It's part of the deal. I mean, part of reviewing and criticism is is comparisons, especially to prior work by a given creator. And if we decide to cover the upcoming ballet related show right then guess I'm what sure we'll be talking about bunheads how could we not well right? i mean i haven't seen that show but i mean they do reuse their ideas yeah they so just it's, it's just interesting i guess as fans of their work so yes. um you know so that's just kind of how we look at things but there will be less gilmore girl talk i promise you wink all right, so this episode picks up in the future, 1987. What did you think when you when you started to see, like, hey, we're in a jail? Yeah, I was surprised. Joel looked horrible, and uh, <laughs> I was like, wow, we have gone through some stuff. You know, he looked like he had been through the ringer. Do you have any ideas about why you think Joel's in the clink? I mean, they didn't give us the reason, so we're going to have to throw out some ideas. There were a couple of context clues that kind of suggested, like, this was maybe minimum security, like the kind of place where they put, like, white collar or mafioso types that... Um, Whoa, where have we heard that before? That cut a deal, you know, that, that uh, don't go in with, like, the hardened criminals. I think it's called Gen Pop, Paul, if you're yeah. in the know. Yeah, like well. Like me, you're not like a felon like me. <laughs> well, but minimum security is like a whole I'm not a felon. other facility kind of thing that that's, doesn't have the same kinds of right. you know, uh, rigors, I guess. Okay. <laughs> kind of the Shawshank element of <laughs> your prison stay. What did you think about seeing Joel so old like that? I mean, is it a little bit creepy to see these people like kind of coming into years that we knew? I mean, like 1987, we were 10 years old. Like we knew that part of the world. Like we lived in a part of the time when Joel lived. Yeah. Like, isn't that wiggy? Like I, we're crossing paths. We could have been near the prison. But we were on the outside. We were. We yeah. Because were, we were children. Yeah. I mean, 1987, I was in Washington State. Oh, uh, hmm. I would have been in uh, Massachusetts. You know, some things that I remember from the previous year would have been like <laughs> Expo, I believe, <laughs> had been in uh, Vancouver, and uh, the Transformers movie would have come out the prior year, oh, wow. but he would have been in jail probably. Well, nice to like put us in a time and place. I, I do have to give props to all of our hair and makeup people. I think that they're doing a good job of aging Joel and Midge during these different flashbacks. I feel like, I guess they're flash forwards for our characters, they're flashbacks for us. But, you know, I thought I thought that they looked older, They and, but in a believable way. Like it wasn't too over the top for me. Oh yeah, I mean, kind of a respectful, plausible thickening around all of the 
applicable parts. Jowls. Everybody's yeah. got jowls now. <laughs> without overdoing it. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. But the, still, the conversation between the two was very charming, that they are still have a simpatico kind of thing. I think they they will always love each other. Like, they're, they're that couple that, like, I don't know that it is the happy ending for anybody, for the two of them to be together. But I think for them to be working together whether they're a, a full-fledged couple or not but working together cooperating together that's good enough for me that's all i want to see for them i think that's like a fully functional family if everybody's working together and making it all happen so i'm curious about why joel's here the clearly again like you said they are a unit here in some way she's definitely supportive of him she's so. giving him stuff to trade yeah. <laughs> can you imagine that's hilarious can you imagine though oh my god all right, so the other context clues that we get that might contribute to Joel's prison stay mm -hmm. come later in this episode when, well, I mean, just right after the flash forward, actually, when we meet up with Joel and Archie sizing up this former Catholic facility for a supper club, and he is... <laughs> Most people will call it a church, Paul. Well, but that wasn't the actual like sanctuary part of the church, was it? I think it was minus pews because he said there's a stage. I think that was the altar. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> but they're not Catholic, so he called it a stage, which is funny. That's funny. <laughs> but he makes some comments about about mm. overhearing about the mobsters and yes. Susie and his growing discomfort with that and his kind of need to figure that out. Yeah, he definitely seems like enough is enough for him. And, you know, they did a good job of layering Joel in the last couple of episodes. When you think about what's going on with the mob, like he's always overhearing a conversation or the, the camera will kind of pan over like when the, she was doing the garbage singing <laughs> musical. He, he was like watching her have conversations with other people and they would like show him in the background watching so it's like you could pick up along the way like all right he is invested this is far more than like one thing he overheard or whatever he has been there and plus if you remember in previous seasons remember he has been on Susie about the financials and what exactly is going on and if everything is on the up and up like he he has stuck his nose in for good or for bad whether he had any right doing that or not he has consistently been kind of poking around, making sure that Susie's keeping Midge safe, which I appreciate that they didn't just spring that idea on, that all of a sudden Joel would just throw in and end up going to prison because of something with Susie and Midge, you know? We've seen enough Sopranos to know <laughs> that if the mob has a hold of your operation. Holy smokes. It, it doesn't have, the mob doesn't have good sense of boundaries when it comes to that kind of thing. That and guess what? They don't owe you anything in terms of like fairness, right? So it's like if they made some deal with Susie and they rolled Midge into it, despite the fact that Midge never agreed. And we talked about this in a previous episode about the 30% of Midge's career lifetime, all that kind of stuff that kind of thing they don't give that stuff back easily if at all really in real life i don't know that they ever give back stuff like that that they have written into an agreement <laughs> you know like I, I don't know it seems like once you're there you're there but you know maybe that is the reputation it yes. is so i i don't know if joel is going to be able to help this situation at all i don't know that Susie is going to be able to get out from under them at all we 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 shall see i know that there's going to be a lot more coming for that well, definitely, especially as Susie has business picking up like crazy. I have to tell you this real quick about that supper club idea. As odd as that might have seemed to people, we actually have a church here in Houston that was renovated and turned into a restaurant. Um, and it's supposed to be beautiful and, and amazing and the stained glass windows and all that kind of stuff. So it's not so out there. You know, if you were just watching and you're like, what in the world? A supper club? Like, what are they talking about? But this wasn't such a crazy idea, you know. And during the 60s, this this was a time when churches were starting to close. You, I don't know, Paul, how much you remember. But, like, a lot of our, like, local, well, like, some of, like, where my parents lived, they used to have, like, a church on, like, every corner in Pennsylvania. That and was it was too like, many churches. Right. And slowly but surely, they were, like, condensing the Catholic churches. Like, it stopped being the Lithuanian church and the Polish church and the Italian church. Like, they just were like, no, we're having one Catholic church in this neighborhood now. So I could see where there would be available buildings, is what I'm trying to say. So I, I feel like this, this was appropriate. And fascinating that Joel is doing so well. Did you get the impression that the Button Club was that successful that he would have money to like purchase a church and start a whole nother business? 
Fun fact, here in Houston, we also have a basketball arena that was turned into a church. So I guess it goes <laughs> both ways. That's funny. That's true. Um, <laughs> no, I hadn't made that that leap. I, I figured that the Button Club was earning him a living, but I didn't have enough evidence to see that this is like an expandable right. venture for him. Which, good for him. I'm happy that it, that it is going well. Every time they've shown us the button club, to be totally fair, it's been full. You know, there's been lots of people at the tables and they've they've always had the, the band playing and drinks flowing and everything. So they've certainly not given us any indication that it's not going well. I guess his parents didn't cause any lasting, <laughs> lasting harm. damage, right? right? Exactly. Exactly. We do get some time frame on that jail stay in that he is looking at a picture of grand kiddo and saying, well, maybe he gets to see her in four to six months. So we get some time frame on how long he's actually due to be in there. Back to Susie, though. Business is booming. This is a far cry from typing up her own business cards oh, and, 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 and double checking that you were actually going to use the card if she gave you one <laughs> because she didn't want to waste it. She only had like five, remember yeah. at the beginning? It was so cute. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it was heartwarming to see all those people banging down Susie's door, wanting her to be their representative. I mean, it's amazing. Everybody's doing really well, you know? I mean, people are wanting what the Joels and the Susies of the world, they're kind of, they're tapping into it. They're figuring out what people want something about the Paladinos and their talent for being able to create a whimsical time filler. It has nothing to do with anything, <laughs> but the short conversation with Alfie about the shitting llama. Oh my God, you were dying. <laughs> I mean, it has no no real bearing on the story or or anything, but it's it's almost like a lot like a writing and an acting challenge to get through it, you know, and make it happen and and not take up more time then is welcome and, and is successful. I, and I'm going to throw out that it's a challenge for the audience too, because again, this is a final season of a series that people have really loved. And so there is this really pervasive, aggressive need for all the information. Please tell us every single plot point you could possibly throw at us in the, in the last season of a show. So when you get llama bits that take like three or four minutes, say, to go through, audiences can get very restless in their seats. Like, get back to mid or get back to, you know, like the main plot points because the clock is ticking and you feel like, you know, oh my God, at any second, this whole show is going to be over and I'm going to have spent any time watching something silly. But that's the genius of this show and the way that these writers create all their characters is that they do have these funny little side things. Like, how about the actor who... Susie is trying to get the job for, for James, right? And so he's trying to like, you know, constantly be asking, did he get the job? But it's like this behind the scenes, very small thing where like every time he gets very anxious, he starts going into the lines like for yeah. the audition. I thought that was so funny. And I don't know, even such a small character, which he was around, he was, he was back from last season. Remember Dinah discovered him? As a comedian last season, I don't know if you remember him. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they had been pals. I, it, you could have just forgotten about him completely, but they just they kept his part small. But it was very consistent and quiet in the background. For me, I think that Daniel's love of music actually feels like the way that they write. Like they layer it. Like there's these different little rhythms or different instruments or doing different things at different points, and they like layer them all together, and it makes for this very eclectic, very deep type of an episode but it makes people crazy when they don't want to see too much llama right yeah they don't want to spend too much time talking about alfie although we do know that alfie is going to be in their next series in that ballet series so not as alfie the magician i assume right the actor Gideon <laughs> but the Glick, actor right. will be in the next one so so clearly they're wanting to keep him on screen too i think to I try think to that's it. remind us who he is and yeah try to like him Hey, speaking of that show, Luke Kirby is also going to be on that new ballet show. Yeah, they're just kind of dangling that out Lenny there. Bruce, yeah. Right, as uh, something to look forward to if you liked his his work in this. So Susie goes through quite a bit of trouble in this episode to gain an audience with the producer, this indecisive guy that just won't make up his mind with the casting. And it is amusing, all of the ways and calls and different routes and spying and all the stuff she has to do. But I think that goes a long way to telling us to kind of filling in, projecting forward from this point, 
the kind of resourcefulness and manager that Susie is going to be for all of her people from now on, if she, when she finds the people that she wants and doesn't just send <laughs> sight unseen home from her hallway. I mean, this is a lot, but at least we can say if she did this for him, then this is probably what she's going to do forever. Right. And I think that it gives us the, you know, this massive glimpse into her depth, you know, that she's willing to go to get these jobs for her people. And we knew that. I mean, we saw her do this kind of hustle the whole series. Right. But she's just gotten so much better at it. And these antics are so much bigger and bolder. And I feel like that's what I was getting out of it was sort of this like speeding up and amping up of how far she's willing to go to get jobs for her people. And then how much her clients are like appreciating that though. And like, she's clearly like, a, you know, an agent that people want to work with. At the end of that whole sequence, when she is sort of daydreaming about getting fitted for a suit for, I think the Academy Awards, is that something we're to assume happens? Or is that something she is daydreaming and projecting like, I can see this happening, but we're not supposed to think that's what happened. Because I was left kind of confused. I think they left it ambiguous. I mean, I think we can think that 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 was sort of a version of a flash forward, right? But sort of like yeah. I don't think it would be out of line for us to think like, well, maybe that that could happen in the future. But I was thinking maybe, in the moment, I was thinking it was like a time jump, but nope, it was no. not. Or maybe it could have even been for her. Like maybe it was letting us know how much bigger she's thinking. You know, I mean, like before it was just like a big deal to just get a club gig or something. But like the idea that she would actually be be even like daydreaming about something so big, you know, mm -hmm. as as something so like national stage kind of thing, international stage, like that's a whole nother level that I'm happy that Susie is getting to even in her dreams, even if that's not ever coming true. I'm happy to think that she would think so big. A couple of classic lines stemming from the bathhouse. What'd you see? A lot of dicks. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Very good. Or... Of all the times to start a nude conga line. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so funny. <laughs> I mean, the, as an adult person, you can't help but just get an, a mental image of what that must look like. And, and whether or not you want it or not. <laughs> They conjure it, and that's hey. that's effective stuff. What is it, the, the baby elephant walk? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Sorry about that. I'm not. I think I've it's got funny. got a little grasp in my chest still there. Yeah. <laughs> it was the elephant joke. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. A fun little side story in this episode was Zelda's quick marriage and all of the family members pitching in to make this happen for her. Was there a larger meaning that we were supposed to get out of that kind of rapid fire series of realizations that they were having during Janusz's vows? I mean, I think it was pretty plain what we were supposed to get out of it, really. I mean, I think they, they've done such a good job of actually putting Zelda in a variety of situations to where it is reasonable that she has a relationship with the Maisels, that Mr. and Mrs. Maisel Sr. would be there, Shirley and Moish would be there. And in the Paladino universe, weddings are not always the thing. You know, a lot of times it happens in a different way than you expect it, you know, certainly uh, in, in the show I won't mention. Um, <laughs> but they were, but you know, there's a lot of things that happened here that I just think were so heartwarming and lovely. I mean, Shirley taking such like loving care of Zelda and her, and her heirloom dress and trying to make it perfect. And just that whole scene of her crawling underneath her dress and all that stuff. I mean, adorable. But then of course the Weissmans make it about them and her employment and well, how long is she going to be gone? And like, all, all the, I mean, it, it's just, it's so like them, you know, for all the people who kind of point at Midge and be like, oh, she's so selfish or she's so self-centered or something like that. I'm like, look at her parents. Like this is in the middle of someone's wedding and they're like trying to get her like two week notice information out of her. Like, <laughs> right. I mean, it, yeah, they're, <laughs> They're out of control, but but I thought that the actual scene was really heartwarming and it made you smile to see all those people in the same place and to see Zelda happy and Janusz is a great add to their group. So 
I enjoyed that portion. Well, and it's a big part of this season, I guess, is the and the show is is ongoing change. Yeah, and that that they are going to have to figure out what the next steps are, you know, what for everybody. And that included when Midge and Joel then like went outside and they were like kind of talking with one another. And of course, during the wedding thing, not not only did Zelda not working for the Wisemans come up, but then the childcare situation too was like all like, ah. So they were like talking about all kinds of things, but it ends with Midge and Joel like kissing out on that balcony area out on the fire escape. And that was a big surprise to me. Is Joel's protective attitude swoony for a ex-wife like that is that grounds to be like you lug and i mean i don't know it all depends on the people to be honest with you because it could be like wow that's really like romantic and wonderful that he's like looking out for her but on the other hand it's like he's the one that went off with his secretary like we're not we can't put him up on some pedestal like he's such a great guy looking out for midge like what penny pan two yeah. words his his primary concern is the kids, he says. It is. And so that's understandable. I've stated before that I that my end game for these two is cooperation, but not cohabitation. Exactly. Oh, I hadn't heard that, but that's a that's a good you should cross stitch that one. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, what did you think of Zelda wedding? I mean, did you enjoy it? I mean, it went on for a long time and there was a lot going on with that as the backdrop. Well, I mean, it was still classic paladino kind of stuff just madcap minutia overlaid with broader concerns you know surely climbing underneath the dress during the vows to tend to a rip in the i don't know what you call it the undercarriage of the dress and um abe getting stuck on uh, needing to finish his uh, Chopin piece and being insulted that no one will will be enriched by the art that he's letting flow he from his fingers. It. That was so funny. <laughs> the shave and a haircut. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. So funny. I thought it was very well written. It was very like, it, like for, for, I can't think of like better words, but it felt very like homey and like folksy and like you kind of just understood everybody's personalities and how they all work together. And it wasn't heated and ugly, but they were still having this kind of chaotic dialogue going back and forth that was urgent, but not angry or anything like that. So it had like, like all the spiciness that I like of the dialogue that they do so well. Let's swing over to Midge and talk about her big adventure, if we will. It's like Pee-wee's big adventure, right? Except it's on a boat, not a bicycle. We get to see a little bit of passage of time and growing acceptance of Midge in the writer's room when we see her teammates helping with school projects. <laughs> that was cute and funny. That was cute and funny. And, and that's so Midge. It is so Midge that she would like bring that all in and like coerce her coworkers into like helping make the project. <laughs> so dead on. I tried to look up Diddy Do diaper cream. I don't think that's a real thing. What do you think about this concept of having a sponsor that, you know, they're kind of feeling, Gordon's feeling like maybe it's not like a cool enough sponsor, you know, it's it's not it's not the demographic he wants to be aiming for. I mean, is he just being foolish? It's like, come on. It, it, he's already said he plays to Middle America. What are you doing, Gordon? What are you so mad about having this sponsor? I'm sure it's cool to, I mean, I'm not sure what the, the exact um, product would be that would be advertised at the time period, whether it would be like today it would be beer or cars or, you know, something that that is appealing to the man of the house, quote unquote, right? That, mm. that, that, that and we're dealing with like super stereotypes when it comes to advertising. Like that's just something we all have to get over in this conversation. Like everybody's, oh, sure. everybody's being pigeonholed. Everybody, you know, it's like if you, you know, only a woman would change a diaper. So that's how Gordon's looking at it. Oh, in that time it. period. And, yeah, that's the only way that things are, are th those are the only buckets available, man but and ad, woman. But advertising in general, even now today, this still pigeonholes people into categories. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to do that as your podcasters, but we're saying that Gordon definitely had an idea of which slice of the pie he wanted and Dippy Doo diaper cream was not the demographic that he felt his show deserved. Do you feel like being being what we would consider like a late night Tonight show kind of show is he off with that you think he's like no just as many women would stay up and watch that show as men like he's really off with this and should just kind of like get over himself or is he right that particular way back lens for me doesn't extend far enough to know using this show as like sort of my basis for my thought process here remember how midge would get up on the pilot 
and take her makeup off in the night and then, and then put, put her it back on, on in the morning. Yeah. Before he could see her. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things that women were doing during this time that men were not paying any attention to. And so in that regard, I think that Gordon is overlooking a key demographic for his audience, people who absolutely get up in the night and are taking off their makeup and might just turn on the TV and watch his show if it was on. I really think he was overlooking that demographic. And this was like, I think, a nod to the idea that like women weren't even being thought about in that way. It was all selling to men. And that's the only way we were thinking about it. Meanwhile, they've shown us the behind the scenes of all these women from Rose to Zelda to Shirley to Susie to Midge, all these women and all their hustle and everything they're doing. And Gordon just like with like a flip of his hand is like disregarding that entire demographic and really like the Astrid's of the group, too. So understanding that advertising is this complicated dance, right, between like the the audience and what the showrunners want the audience to be. This is a really tricky episode in terms of how do we deal with these executives and have it go well, even though Gordon has no interest. He basically just like blows it off, which I'm kind of surprised that George is the one who really like accepts Midge's plan to let her come and be like the ambassador for the show. Now, was this a bad move on George's part? George is oily. We know that Mike can't stand him. And whenever he's on in front of Gordon, he seems to have one face. Whenever he's dealing with other people, he has another face. He has a super aggressive version of himself and then a super smoothie, schmoozy kind of version. From my point of view, George should have had some sense of who Mitch was. This is, again, one of those like the men just aren't paying any attention to her or what she's doing because the shy Baldwin situation was like in the newspaper that she got fired from that gig. There's something about them all sort of ignoring what she does and who she actually is that is setting up this situation because George has no idea what Midge is capable of. And me and you, the second that we knew she was going to be like a spotlit person, I was going back and thinking of it was it the Kennedy fundraiser. Yeah. Oh, my God. When she just like went off saying all the things that they did not want to there to be saying. All I could think is she's going to say or do something. Now, I was really surprised how this actually pivoted. It wasn't her act that she said something that was her act rude. walked the line. It was yeah, just it walked fine. The line, but it was fine. Right. It was this other situation, this social commentary kind of portion about how men treat women and what she was going to stand there and watch happen versus step in. Did you think that she should step in with the waitress and, and get involved with that whole situation? That was very in character. That's all great. The part where I I, I cringed like all of us. <laughs> yeah, was was with the jacket, you know, which is, of course, the whole thing. Um, right. Th did she need to go that far? Did she need to take it to kind of like this property level or could she have just been like, OK, the girl's out of harm's way harm's right? way and uh you know i come out on top on this one so let's just walk away but no she didn't leave it there when she could have did she purposely kind of let the jacket out of her fingers and let it go in because i find it hard to believe i know we we kind of play this game with midge where at times she's graceful and elegant and put together and classy and then these other times when she's so Amelia Bedelia, clumsy, falling down, knocking stuff over, stuff like that happens to her kind of every episode. So I'm on the fence about whether she like was like, oops, I dropped your nah. coat or whether it really did get out of her the hand. The look on her face was very much like, oh, shit. If what you're saying is true, I could see where kind of that. I don't know if you've ever seen where bullies will do this sort of thing like, I have your thing. Oh, it's out of my head. Oh, I, never mind. I have it. It's okay. What are you freaking out about? Like that kind of move. Okay, yeah. So maybe, but the look on her face was like an oh shit kind of thing. Maybe it was dawning on her all at once. What was at stake with what just happened? You know, with like a sponsor see, that's or job. Where, see, that's where I'm going. I don't think her oh shit was like, oh, the fabric slipped between my fingers. Oh shit. I think it was Midge opened her freaking fingers, let it fall out. And then the realization of the consequences of what she just did made her say, oh shit. But I, I think she's so impulsive 
that though they do weigh that out again, like I said, she has this like clumsy side, this awkward side that maybe she did just accidentally flip it. That's kind of the genius of the scene, right? Did she purposely do this situation? Was it just an accident? Who knows? She can play it kind of every which way. But personally, I don't think Midge does that kind of thing on an accident. I didn't read it that way, but I'll leave that open for interpretation because on a rewatch, I'll look closer. Well, and people might say, why does it matter? What difference does it make if she let go of that jacket on purpose or if it just flew out of her hands? And I'm going to say it goes to intention. What was her intention in this situation? Was it simply to break apart the guy from the waitress? Or did she want to make a bigger point about touching other people's things, about non-consent, about not wanting someone to be bothering you and they are bothering you and they take it to a level that now you're upset, you know? So I feel like how is she telling that message if he, she doesn't let go of the jacket, you mm -hmm. know? So I don't know. It was very funny. I would be willing to put some money down on this. Like I'll put 20 bucks down on this. I'm kind of wondering if someone found out about this pirate rule and like put the gauntlet down in a writer's room and was like, see if you can make this come up in an episode. Basically that somebody getting out to international waters is now considered a pirate because this jacket goes overboard. Like it'll be like create a situation where someone becomes a pirate and is charged with piracy. It'll be like know? something like sometime between seasons the paladinos went on a on a dinner yes, cruise yes. off manhattan yes. or something and it was just it came up in conversation by the way did you know that if you dropped something overboard right now something it, of value right it would be pirate's booty or whatever <laughs> right <laughs> see and i think that's like a funny concept so i like to think that this episode actually was based on some sort of big fat bet about like can you get this joke in there also i think it is setting midge up to be this really great advocate for women at a time when other women would just walk on by and not say anything be like men what are you gonna do you know she stepped in and and i think that for people who have a lot of question marks about midge's character and like if she's like a good person a value person i feel like she is and i don't even know if she did anybody any favors by having that jacket go overboard for me i hate those situations because obviously there's like the it's the right thing to do to step in and be an advocate for somebody else and also it's like, how far do you go and how big of a deal do you make? And like, at what point is it a positive that suddenly gets out of control? You know, mm -hmm. it, there's weird walking of lines there that, you know, Midge never does well. Again, she's she is no tightrope walker. She stomps wherever she goes, despite the fact that she kind of presents herself as this like ballerina type. She's really not that careful. I mean, you think to the pilot, the scene on stage when her boob kind of like falls out of her night. Oh, she's pulled both out. of them out. Yeah, but it, but but it's well, it's it's kind of like one's kind of getting loose on her there. <laughs> okay, right? then she just gives up. Right. Yeah, yeah. and that kind of I understand that it was a bad night and there were yeah, other other factors badly, yeah. uh, going, but still, sort of like a, a loss of the calculated presentation that she normally has. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, I give them credit as a show for trying to shed some light on, you know, social issues like that, like people interacting men and women and, and just what was acceptable and what wasn't at different time periods. You know, I give them credit for that, for bringing it up in that Midge is trying to be on the right side of history, I guess, that she she is somebody who would stand up for another woman. She is somebody who would step in and be like, hey, cut it out. That's great. That's a feather in Midge's cap, I think, as a character. Now, I think it's hilarious that none of us blink an eye about her being arrested at all ever in the show. <laughs> oh, I yeah. At the beginning, it was so like, oh, and then by now it's like, who cares? Like she's arrested all the day, which for us, I mean, I mean, I've never been arrested. You've never been arrested. I think it would be a very big deal, but it's like, <laughs> <"Meh."> <laughs> What are we going to do, right? Well, I mean, it's new to be taken into custody <laughs> by the piracy. by the Coast Guard. That's so that, true. That's fresh. Oh, my God. Seeing her getting taken away by the little boat. Oh, my God. We've seen that in, like, several other shows recently that I feel like there was, like, a lot of emotion pulling from other shows, like Succession. There's that one where I'm not, I'm, I won't say all the characters' names in case y'all are not all caught up, but this was another season where like there's a girl on a boat dad decides no and like they send her away and he's like watching this little boat go away with this lady he's like oh that was so awkward there's something about that that's terrible but so okay so now we get this whole midge situation we're gonna have this meeting with gordon did you expect gordon to just fire her on the spot or have some big explosion with her i kind of did 
But what that scene was nice and illustrated was the true power structure of how this show is, right? George presents like he's in charge because he is the producer and he handles a lot of administrative kinds of things. But turns out where the rubber meets the road, Gordon's name is on the thing and it's Gordon's freaking show. I was surprised, but I guess maybe not given the conversation we just had. Mitch is pretty much overlooked. I mean, Gordon holds the men to task, not Midge. Partially, I think that's super dismissive. Like it's like, oh, she's just a woman. She couldn't have known what, she, what was going to happen. But you, George, you're the man. You should have known. Well, the bigger relationship is with George. George of course. And, and he told George, make it go away. He didn't want to have anything to do with the sponsor. So yeah, it was out of line totally to be there. But what I didn't really see was that Gordon was going to actually be like kind of amused by Midge and like the antics and Susie for that matter too. I didn't see him like having like a soft spot for her exactly. Now that's the way characters in Paladino world are where they can do things that are like the rest of us are like, oh my God, my boss would kill me. But yet it turns out to be like a lovable rogue <laughs> that they did that, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So I'm not surprised, but I mean, do you think this Gordon Midge thing's going to happen? I mean, she's very much pushing against being Gordon's girl. She does not want to do that because she wants to she get on that show. She says it to him. However, he is quite charming and she doesn't have to work there forever. Well, that's true. But he is married. We can't forget that. He is married. And so I don't in know a way. how, in a way, but I don't know how any of that works. Like, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that just means like she can be his side piece. But then does that mean that like truly she can't progress without him being like a big fat asterisk on her career? Like Gordon Ford really got me where I am. Which we do know that, that Joan Rivers is like, you know, supposedly a huge influence on who the Midge character is supposed to be. And certainly she credits Johnny Carson with the huge break in her career to finally like right. be like superstardom. So it wouldn't be crazy for Gordon Ford to have that credit, you know, for, for Midge's career. But I don't get that that's how that's going to play out. That is one of the more hugely watchable aspects of this season is what is this launch pad going to be? You know, because we've seen the future now. We know right. that she can afford helicopters in Israel, <laughs> right? So, right. She's uber successful. Like, we know that. She can't get there from the writer's room in the Gordon Ford show. So what is it that's going to happen? What's going to break the dam? Does she get on the show? Does she get on someone else's show? Does she get her own show? Ooh. Something's got to give here. <laughs> Something does got to give. I really look forward to that aspect of this season and figuring out like, well, what is going to be the thing? Like, when is she going to like shoot out of the cannon and suddenly, you know, become the superstar? She's still struggling at this point. She's still just in the writer's room. She's not out there doing these, you know, major gigs or anything. So what's going to happen where are we and i'm i'm really looking forward to the next episode and crossing my fingers that we're going to get more about the meat of her career like how did we get there and will gordon end up being this springboard or is it going to be like in spite of gordon and all his roles and everything does he end up does she end up see i think it's going to be mike I don't think it's going to be Gordon. I think it's going to be Mike because of the real life relationship between them being, you know, husband and wife in real life, Rachel Brosnahan. And but I think the, the show is going to be the springboard, whether it's Mike or Gordon. OK, or whether it, whether it's she somehow does break through the invisible barrier and becomes a guest, whether she for some reason is tapped to sub in for Gordon, God forbid, rather than just cancel the show because the man is sick or whatever. She has, she takes the desk for the night that he's gone or whatever. Were you surprised though, to find out in a previous episode that so many of the writers in there were like stand up comedians and did have careers in their own right that they were very much like, midge's contemporaries like the, her peers like because uh, she thought i think she thought she was the only viable option in that did. writer's room yeah she did and so when it was like laid out to be like no all these other people are talented too down to the singer they were mentioning you know who was like the doorman or something you know like it was like all of these people are talented too and i think that was a little eye-opening as the audience member to be like if once you get to that level you can't walk around thinking like you're the only one who's got all this talent and all this potential. Like 
that whole room is full of people who could step in for Gordon. So the question mark is, how will it be Midge? And why Midge of anyone in that room when they all have seniority and they all have reasons to be there? What will be the catalyst to have Midge be the one in the spotlight? She probably smells the best. (laughs) That's a good guess. This is Caroline. And this is Paul. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. A five-star rating will help other people find the podcast just like you did. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.